Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to, uh, my name is Nancy Springman. I'm chairman of the, or chairperson, I should say, of the Wellness and Leisure Committee here at Cedar Field. And um, I would like to welcome you to our presentation today um, on better hearing, boost memory, and relationships. Our speaker today is Dr. Deborah Ogilvy. Dr. Ogilvy received her bachelor's degree in speech pathology and audiology from JMU, her master's in audiology from George Washington University, and her doctorate in audiology from um, Salus? Salus, Salus University. She is a fellow of doctors in audiology and is a member of the Virginia Board of Hearing Aid Specialists and Opticians. Dr. Ogilvy has been in practice since 1995 and is currently one of the owners of Richmond Hearing Doctors located in Midlothian. She comes to Cedarfield twice a month to see residents. If you would like to make an appointment to see Dr. Ogilvy, you just call her Midlothian office and I think she just handed out some brochures that would have her telephone number on it and you tell the um, office that you are a resident here at Cedarfield and you would like to make an appointment with Dr. Ogilvy, and uh, she will see you right here at Cedarfield, so you don't even have to go all the way to Midlothian to her office. Also, information on the times that Dr. Ogilvy will be here in the clinic is on the clinic calendar that's given out to residents every month. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ogilvy. You can tell I'm a satisfied customer. Why, thank you. I have a few hopefully satisfied customers here. Thank you for coming. Well, good, thank you. Hi, thank you for the introduction. I'm Deborah Ogilvy. Thank you all for coming. Oh, okay, wasn't sure what that was. That's, if you can hear, that's the uh, lawnmower behind us. Good timing for that. Uh, if you have trouble hearing me, just raise your hand. I usually don't have a problems speaking and this should help. Uh, so today we're going to talk about hearing loss and brain hearing and relationships and how your hearing can um, hopefully help you with your relationships. But we can answer, uh, I, how long do I have? An hour. An hour, yeah. And then I have a little bit more time after that for questions, um, if anyone has any. So we can answer other questions besides what I talk about if you need to. Um, so don't hesitate. Um, if you want to interrupt, I'll tell you if we should just hold it to the end. Okay, so get everything on here. So let's start with hearing loss. Let me find out who's here today. I, I've already know some of you in the audience. How many of you have hearing loss? Quite a few. Um, how many of you have hearing aids? Okay, good. How many of you are happy with your hearing aids? All of my patients should raise their hand. Um, that's interesting. I mean, everybody, almost everybody raised your hand about hearing aids or hearing loss and about hearing aids and not so many about being satisfied. So I'm glad you're here. Um, we're not going to get too much into hearing aids today. I'd be happy to come back and do another <coughs> seminar about that, but that would also be a reason to come and see me because everybody is different. You know, if I did a seminar just on hearing aids, it would be very broad and everybody is different. So um, that's why we like individual um, appointments. But let's just talk about hearing loss. It is the third most common chronic condition um, in the US. Um, it obviously, especially for people in the older generations, um, it is twice as common as cancer and diabetes. Um, it is common. It's gonna be out there. Um, and then, like I said, in the older population, it's pretty, um, common. <coughs> <coughs> so, 
So one area of research that has, and I have something later in the slides, um, that has been uh, common in the research lately is um, how does hearing loss affect or is how is hearing loss related to other health conditions? And <coughs> what has been found is not that there's a correlation. If you have diabetes, you're going to have hearing loss. If you have hearing loss, you're going to have diabetes. It's not that. But you're more likely to have hearing loss if you have diabetes and heart disease. Um, and the most recent research, which I'll show you at the end, is um, five times ooh, wrong button, wrong button. Um, five times more likely. That's pretty high. How many of you have heart disease? Less than I thought. How many of you have diabetes? Wow. Well, wrong population here. Okay. <laughs> we'll move on. Um, and. This one right here is in the wrong spot. Um, women are more likely, oh. Yeah, men are more likely to have hearing loss. And that is because they are more likely to have diabetes and heart disease, but they're also more likely to be around loud noise. Most likely their work exposure, their noise exposure in their history. Um, and then the research had just shown that women are more likely to wear hearing aids. I don't know the percentage, but thought that was interesting. Men tend to lose the higher frequencies first, the higher pitches, which happens to be women's voices. And women tend to lose lower frequencies. Not quite all the way in those deep low pitches, but the lower frequencies, kind of more in the mid frequencies. But men's voices do fall into those deeper low frequencies. So it's quite common that you have trouble hearing each other. <laughs> Once again, um, the, the research with dementia and memory issues has been researched quite a bit with hearing loss. And it's been shown mild hearing loss doubles your risk for leading towards dementia, moderate hearing loss triples your risk. We'll get more into that in a few minutes. So that's just some brief facts. Many of you probably know, since you already know you have hearing loss and wear hearing aids, but here's a, just a quick video about how the ear works and how hearing works, just for a little interest more interesting than me telling you about it. Cells and are grouped together as hair cell bundles inside the cochlea. 
The hair cells inside the cochlea ride these waves, and the hair bundles are moved. The hair bundle on top of the hair cell turns these movements into electrical signals. As the hair bundles are moved, ions rush into the top of the hair cells, causing the release of chemicals at the bottom of the hair cells. The chemicals bind to the auditory nerve cells and create an electrical signal, which travels along the auditory nerve to the brain. Different hair cells respond to different frequencies of sound. The hair cells at the base of the cochlea detect higher pitched sounds, such as a piccolo or flute. The hair cells toward the top of the spiral detect progressively lower pitched sounds, such as a trumpet or trombone. At the very top or apex of the spiral, the hair cells detect the lowest pitched sounds, such as a tuba. The auditory nerve carries the electrical signal to the brain which interprets the messages as sounds that we recognize and understand. about is two ears and a brain. Um, so the cochlea is really the organ of hearing and inside the cochlea are these little hair cells. And they, they're really like little hair cells that stand up and when they get damaged by noise exposure or aging um, or medications, they literally kind of break or weaken or fall and disappear or, like I said, break off. So that's what it looks like when you lose your hair cells and have hearing loss. And that's the most common type of hearing loss. It's referred to as a sensory neural hearing loss. A lot of people still know it as nerve damage even though it's not truly the nerve that's damaged it's the little hair cells in the inner ear the other type of hearing loss is conductive hearing loss and that's in the middle ear those bones or the eardrum that is damaged somehow any questions about just general hearing loss and the cause yes can you tell from the hearing tests what kind of damage people have? So the question is, can you tell from the hearing test what type of damage? Yes, and that is pretty much the purpose of the hearing test, is to determine the degree and type of hearing loss. If it's a conductive or mixed, meaning there's damage in the middle ear as well as the inner ear or nerve, um, then that needs to at least have a medical evaluation um, because that the middle ear possibly can be treated to have your hearing corrected to some degree. Not always, but at least there's a possibility. The little hair cells at this point cannot be corrected. That's a whole other area of research to regenerate the hair cells or um, stem cells and all of that. So that's right now a permanent hearing loss. Um, but the middle ear, those bones, um, fluid infection, the eardrum, all of that um, is a type of hearing loss that could be improved or corrected medically. And that's less common, especially as you age. That's a close-up of those inner ear hair cells. So now we're at the brain. We don't always know from the hearing test if it's the hair cells or the nerve itself. Um, depending on the results of the hearing test, we may do a little extra testing 
to separate that out. But a lot of times we don't need to know that. Um, there are certain things we're looking for to help determine if there's a nerve problem. But that's relatively rare, and unless we see other signs that tell us it could be a nerve issue, we're not gonna go to those type of tests. So we, even though it's long-term been referred to as nerve damage, it's most likely these hair cells until we have a reason to think otherwise. And yes? If a person normally loses some hair as they age, does that affect the loss of the hair in the cells? Good question. If you lose hair as you age, does that affect the hair cells in the ear? Completely different type of hair. Um, these are hair cells a little bit more, they look more like the hair on your skin, but they're not hair like your hair. They're more like um, you know, cells in your body. They're more like the biology, if you go back to your biology classes and those type of cells in your body, but they just look like hair is why we call them hair cells. So, once the sound gets past all of that, it gets to the brain. And so the brain has to do a lot of work. The brain can, um, helps determine, helps to figure out, obviously, a lot of things, but for hearing, um, so four of the more important um, things would be telling where the direction is coming from of the sound. Um, helps to focus, so is it an important sound or is it something that can be put in the background? Um, is it something I know, recognize, um, or is it a new sound that I need to really pay attention to? Um, and separating it from, um, again, is it a speech sound or is it a noise? And again, it doesn't have to be in the background, but is it speech that I need to understand, or is it something else? Um, and a lot of times that's where your brain has to work pretty hard because a lot of times the speech is the noise. When you get into a restaurant, all the other people talking garbles together and becomes noise. And so the brain has to figure out what's the important speech versus all that garbled speech. So the brain has a lot to do. If the brain is not, so the brain is working hard. Um, when there is damage, when the brain is not getting all the signal it needs, there's, um, it's not going to work as well as it should. And research has tried to figure out why. Um, and so there are three reasons on why, uh, there are three theories on why the brain um, does not do as well as it should be doing based on its hearing. Um, so the first is cognitive load. And that's basically how it gets so much information. It's hearing so much, but it's also, you know, um, dealing with your thoughts of other things. It's also dealing with how you're feeling. It's also dealing with memories. I mean, it's obviously dealing with everything. But if you're not hearing well, um, your brain has to work harder just to hear. It has to, um, it has to work harder to make sense of what it's hearing and put it back in memory and be able to, you know, make sense of it for that conversation. And it's working so hard for that conversation that if someone is, if something else, um, grabs your attention, you're like, wait, what was that? because it's so focused on hearing that it can't do multiple things. That's why the multitasking 
when you're trying to hear is difficult. Um, or multitasking in general. It may not be partially because you're trying to hear, it's because you're trying to do multiple things and your brain as you get older can't do all of that. And it might be because if you have hearing loss, it's working so hard to hear, it doesn't have room for all these other tasks. How many of you have been to physical therapy for anything? And you've probably heard the term use it or lose it. So if you don't exercise that muscle that you just had surgery on or you've been laying in bed for weeks or months, it's not going to work as well. So if your brain, the area of your brain for hearing is not stimulated, meaning you have hearing loss, but you're not, the brain is not getting that signal because you have hearing loss, it has been shown that that area of your brain will atrophy over time. It does it with other areas of the brain as well for other things. And the only way they can really tell this is with cadavers. So it's not like they can do an uh, MRI of your brain and go, you know, your brain has shrunk. I mean, they can tell different things, but they can't tell your brain has shrunk in this area because you have hearing loss. So it's not something we can monitor over time. Um, but with people like who have had Alzheimer's and they pass away and they donate to research and then they look at their brain, that's how they've kind of figured out these type of things. Um, but there is um, the use it or lose it theory with hearing loss as well. And then one that I think a lot of people have heard about and reading about hearing loss is the so social isolation or becoming more um, um, separated, kind of just backing away, doing less activity. If you don't hear what's going on, a lot of people find themselves um, not enjoying their, what used to be their activities. A lot of times they may not realize that that's why they're stopping going to dinners or going to lunches or, or um, playing cards or meeting with those friends. It's, they may not realize it's their hearing. Most of the time they don't. It's, it just wasn't as fun or those people, um, they don't talk as much as they used to or um, you know, they always mumble. That's the big one. Um, so with that, a lot of times other people see that first and realize that they're getting more um, secluded and maybe even starting to look more depressed and lonely. And this can be hard to get out of because once you get into that, you kind of don't want, it's hard to get back into what you've stopped doing. Um, so this, a lot of research has really shown to be um, common with, uh, we're talking about untreated hearing loss. So hearing loss that um, you've not done anything about or you've stopped wearing hearing aids. So, Something that has less research and less talked about is how all of that has affected your relationships with other people. Um, but you can easily, you probably can tell me more about it, but um, that isolation and that um, backing out of activities definitely has an effect on how you interact with other people, especially your loved ones. Um, what happens is, again, we're talking about untreated hearing loss. So you have hearing loss, but you're, you're not wearing your hearing aids or they're not working for you, and you think you're doing okay, but your spouse is probably going, when are you getting hearing aids? When are you doing something about it? So there's that 
breakdown in communication. You lose that spontaneity of small talk and those little jokes and those little um, side conversations. Did you know Julie did this? Did you hear about the grandkids? Did you see her? Those little things, and if the other one, if your spouse didn't hear it, they go, huh, what? Never mind. I'll tell you later. And you just lose that interaction. So one probably ends up in one room, and one ends up in the other room, and they're watching TV in different places. And so you become frustrated. And then one person, if somebody still has the normal hearing, is probably doing the translating and repeating everything. And it can be frustrating for everyone. But there may be some of that resentment for having to, okay, so this is what we talked about tonight. This so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said that, and we're going here then. So it's difficult for both the person with hearing loss, because they're just not hearing, and the person who still has better hearing to have to go through the whole conversation again. It's just hard on everybody. And then, again, they start to withdraw. Maybe one person starts to stay home, and the other does their own activities, or you're both watching TV in other ro different rooms. And so there's stress for both partners. Um, loss of companionship. You're not doing the things you used to do anymore. And that can be difficult on everybody. The stress on your health becomes difficult. One thing we didn't talk about here was um, the effects of hearing loss. We mentioned it. Um, you're more likely to have heart issues and diabetes and hearing loss, um, untreated hearing loss, you're more likely to end up in the hospital. But you know the effects of stress on the body as well, even if you have normal hearing, but now you're stressed about your partner, you're gonna not sleep well, you're not gonna eat well, you're gonna have all of those other stress problems. So it's really not a good situation for either one of you. I get this question a lot. How to talk to a loved one about hearing loss? How do I get them in for a hearing test? What do we do? How do I get them in? I can't take it anymore. It's hard. Hopefully, if any of you are the ones, it's not me, I don't have the hearing loss, I don't have to do anything. Hopefully some of this, if this is you or um, it's your partner, um, realize that it's a normal process of aging, it's, um, it's just a test. <laughs> That's the first part. The first step is just a test. Um, and definitely want to not, you know, attack them. You want to find a quiet time when they're in a good mood, make them a nice dinner, take them out to dinner. <laughs> Um, in a quiet place where they can hear you. Um, but explain how it's affecting both of you in the relationship, the stress it's causing on both partners, how it's affecting what, how it used to be where you could have those conversations back and forth and you could do activities together and now you can't. And then the next step, which I, this is what I usually recommend, is schedule a hearing test for yourself and say, just come with me. Even if they're reluctant to get the test for themselves, have them come with you for a test for yourself. When, even if you end up with normal hearing, when we go over the results, we talk about hearing loss in general and communication. And those, especially if you tell us that, we, that you want to kind of discuss communication, once we get them in the door, we can discuss how hearing loss affects different people. And they can see how easy the hearing test is, and there's no obligation 
if, even if you don't come to us, most good practices in town are not going to beat you down if you don't leave with a hearing aid. Most people are just doing a test, want you to know what your hearing loss is like, um, and it's education. And part of that education would be talking about what hearing aids are, if they're appropriate for you, um, and how hearing aids would improve those communication situations and the relationship um, issues that you're having. We find ourselves, a lot of patients tell us we're uh, marriage counselors as well. We don't have degrees and we try not to go too deep, but a lot of times there is that um, discussion about how to talk to each other, um, how to talk to someone with hearing loss. Uh, we have a, a few um, handouts, how to talk to someone with hearing loss. Thou shall not talk from um, another room. Thou shall um, turn off the TV when talking to someone. In a cute way so that it's not so um, uh, impact or uh, attacking. So this ACHIEVE study, um, if you want more information about this, I can get it for you or get you the link. <coughs> Running early. Um, this is the study that, uh, the latest study that found um, the correlation between the cognitive decline and um, and the untreated hearing loss. And what they also found was um, those with hearing aids, so those who treated their hearing, um, were more likely to, um, had a less risk for cognitive decline. So briefly, the study um, had a group of people, everybody had hearing loss, they treated one group with hearing aids and the other just with education, just talking to them kind of uh, like this. And over three years measured, they start, all started with normal cognitive ability based on the testing they did. The people who got hearing aids had less, 48% less cognitive decline than those who did not get hearing aids. Um, and everything else was, I think, basically the same. So by treating the hearing loss, um, their brain function was able to stay more active um, than those who did not. After the study, they offered everything to everyone. So that's my basic um, presentation. I do have a few more slides um, on some other things if we're, depending on the questions you have. So let's open it up for questions at this point. Yes? Does Medicare pay for you to come in to get a hearing test? Does Medicare pay for hearing testing? Um, yes, at this point Medicare does pay um, and it's much easier now. We can bill Medicare directly for testing. So uh, when you schedule your appointment, we'll ask you about um, what insurance you have. And um, yes. Yes. I'll be a personal problem. Okay. I go to the auditorium uh, yes. downstairs and I can hear everybody talking and I hear most everything. But then somebody will say something, the audience will react and laugh. And I didn't get that word. Right. Is Why? that a hearing aid? <laughs> Do I have a poor hearing aid? Or is it somewhere in my head? So his question is, he goes to the auditorium and he can hear most everything, but then all of a sudden the audience is laughing. And he didn't get that last part of it and didn't get the joke. Um, it wasn't that he, you didn't hear the, you just didn't realize that it was a joke at all. Um, 
A lot of times when people are talking, especially when you're saying a joke or in natural conversation, that last part kind of goes down or they're talking away from the microphone. And so, but that last part is usually in that high frequency range or those sounds are in those high frequency ranges. And that's where that clarity, that sharpness um, is the most important for your hearing. Most people, even women still, um, have that high frequency hearing loss. So if you're not getting um, the proper fitting, you're not, if you're not getting the, if you're not understanding the conversations in many situations, you're probably not fit the best. So I don't know if it's your hearing loss and or your hearing aids, um, meaning you may have a, such a severe loss that really any hearing aid may not be able to bring you, get you enough. Um, so I'm not gonna guarantee that you would always be able to get that, but um, a lot of older hearing aids or poorly fit hearing aids um, won't bring up those higher pitches to get you that clarity. That's a very common problem with poorly fit um, or older hearing aids. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, with the renovations to Fellowship Hall, there's going to be installed a very sophisticated, and I'm not the right person, I'm not an engineer, but there's going to be a very sophisticated system for being able to hear much clearer in Fellowship Hall. Um, at the Wellness and Leisure Committee meeting yesterday, we discussed this, and I think we're going to plan to have the people who are installing this technology come and give a talk to explain how this is going to work. But I think it's going to be wonderful to help people with or without hearing aids hear the presentations in there better. Did everyone hear that? Is, do you know if there's going to be a loop? Yes. That was something, again, I'm yeah. not an engineer. So there's going to be a loop yeah. system, and that's for people with hearing aids. If, I, if there's any way I could attend that meeting sure. when you know when it's happening. Okay. Um, so if there was a loop system right now, it would be connected to this microphone. It, being that there's renovation going on, it, it's going to be built into the walls. Um, and what would happen is in your hearing aids, if you have it, you would go into a special program. So you might have to push a button or use your app or flip a switch. Um, and then your hearing aids would be connected into the microphone system. And it would be as if I'm talking in your head. And it would be right there. And for the majority of people, it's, it's like I'm talking in your ears. It really works well. Now, not every, but every hearing aid has that. For those of you who are fit by me, the majority of you should, but there definitely are some that were not for various reasons. So um, that's, well, we can talk about that. But it may not be active. So there's going to be a time, I may set up a time that I just get people in and out, in and out, in and out to just activate it. Uh, because it's like a push of a button that I have to turn on in the hearing aid to make it active to work with the system. So it'll be a process. Yes? Is that at all like Bluetooth? It's similar to Bluetooth, but it's not Bluetooth. Yeah, but it's, it's the same idea of two things connecting, but it's different than Bluetooth. Um, now, for those of you who don't have hearing aids or your hearing aids don't have this, it's called T-coil or loop system, they're gonna most likely have like a headphone system that you can wear that's connected to the microphone. So you would just wear that instead and have like a volume control. And it, 
being that it's new, it should work really well. So it's a good thing. Other questions? Yes. When someone needs a cochlear implant, is that a medical issue? Yes, a cochlear implant, is that a medical issue? Um, yes, so that a cochlear implant is not related to the middle ear like I was talking about before. That is really more related to those hair cells, but it's when you really cannot benefit from a hearing aid. So your hearing loss has gotten so bad, it's maybe not that you just can't hear anything. For a lot of, for some people, it's you really can't understand anything. Um, so you have to have a certain amount of hearing loss and or distortion um, to be considered for a cochlear implant. And then you have to go through um, cochlear implant evaluation, which we refer to VCU. Question? Oh, no. I have her hearing it. If somebody wants to talk to me about her product, I'll be glad to talk to you. Thank you. Talk to him if you want a referral for me, <laughs> is what he said. Any other questions? Does anyone have tinnitus or tinnitus, the ringing in your ears? No one? Because I had a few slides on that, but if anyone don't need it, we won't go there. Okay. We have friends who have it. <laughs> Do you want to see the slides? It's like four slides. Yeah. yeah. I have a quick question. Yes. If we see you here. Yes. And yeah, let's talk about that. We have to go to your place for the, no. the hearing. You can do a hearing test here. Yes. So let's talk about what you can, um, how that works. So I'm probably out of the camera. Um, so if you want a hearing test with me here at Cedarfield, you call my office. Uh, the numbers are on the paperwork that you, I gave you. My cards are also up here if you want like a business card. Um, so you call the office, tell them you're at Cedarfield and you want a hearing test. Uh, they'll get your information, we get your vial of life, so we have all of that. Um, I come typically on the second and the fourth Wednesdays except when I have to rearrange, but they'll have my, my office has my schedule and you can ask Bonnie or it'll be on the um, TV. So we do, I bring equipment and we do the hearing test in the clinic with Bonnie, where Bonnie is. Um, I do the hearing test there. We use earplugs that go in the ear and for the most part, it's quiet enough there. Um, and then I can go over the results. We can discuss your situation, your needs. We can order hearing aids. I come back, I have to order them. Um, I fit them in the office. We have a little bit more equipment at, um, I fit them here at Cedarfield in, that, in the clinic. I have a little bit more equipment at my office if we need to, and that's like rare. I have had people, I don't know if anyone's here, that have come out to one of my offices because we've just had difficulty getting it set just right, but rare. Um, so most of the time everything goes really well. I see you back every couple of weeks in the beginning to make sure we're both comfortable with the way it's fitting your ears and the way it sounds and that you know how to use it and take care of them. Um, and then we go on a maintenance. Some people are every three months, some people are every six months. I have a few people every month. <laughs> um, but most people are every three or six months. And I check your hearing once a year or every two years. So it just, everybody's different. Um, but everything is pretty much done here. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Can you tell us about the buildup of wax? In your yes, ears? wax removal. So wax in your ears is pretty typical. 
It's kind of like tears in your eyes and oil in your skin. It's going to be there. Some people have more wax than others. Some people produce more wax as they get older. Some people stop producing wax as they get older. Um, some people have very sticky wet wax. Some people have very dry wax. Um, most people, I can remove the wax in the clinic here as well. I have some people I see every three months or every six months and just a couple I see every month to remove wax from their ears. Um, there are some days that's all I do. <laughs> um, so yeah, wax is part of the year. It's there, it's left over from when we're crawling around on the grounds. It's there to keep uh, bugs and dirt out of the ear. It's, it builds up and it's supposed to work itself out of the ear with normal chewing and mouth movements. Unfortunately, not all ears continue to do that as you get older and it kind of gets stuck. Um, Q-tips are not your friend. They actually push wax deeper down or, or get it stuck back in the ear. So I don't recommend Q-tips. They are, do more harm to your ear than good. Most people, unless you've had ear infections, can flush their ears out with the over-the-counter ear drops and lukewarm water that's in that little blue bulb, or I can talk to you about what to do. Um, if you see Anne in the clinic, she's really good at flushing ears out of, um, flushing the wax out of the ears as well. Um, and then if you don't wear hearing aids, you don't always have to get the wax taken out. The wax is okay for a lot of people. But if you wear hearing aids, the wax interferes with the hearing aid. So it does need to be removed. Yes. I was going to say, um, also, it's if you're having some problems hearing, it's another reason it's very important to see a professional like um, Dr. Ogilvie, um, because if you do have a buildup of wax, um, sometimes that removal of that wax alone can improve your hearing. Yeah, it and could just be so wax. So that's a very simple process um, that might be discovered yeah. during the evaluation by a professional and um, would maybe fix your problem and you wouldn't even have to have hearing aids. Again. So sometimes going to see an audiologist is very important even if even if you just have the slightest problem or even if you as we ache even if you don't have a problem to just have a general baseline evaluation of your hearing. Yes. Um, and I, just a little plug for the people in that wonderful profession. Thank you. Um, going back to that reluctant person who doesn't want to get there, doesn't want to get hearing aids. It's not me, it's everyone else. Um, just, you know, the appointment. We'll just see if you have wax. Let's just see. Um, it could, and I've had people, it's not that common, but where it is just wax. Um, the question hasn't come up, but I'll bring it up. Um, why not go to Costco? The people at Costco cannot remove wax. You have to be an audiologist or a medical doctor or um, nurses as well. Um, but they are hearing instrument specialists. They are not um, medical to remove wax from the ears. So if it's just wax, they may still do the testing, which is ridiculous because how can you do a test with your ear clogged up? But um, so that's a reason not to go there. Um, so we can remove wax, and again, I can do it here. But again, like she said, just gain a baseline test just to see where things are. Always a good idea if you've never had one. Other questions? Yes. How do you remove the wax? Do you flush it out or do you pick it up? So I prefer to use a scoop, a curette. Um, most of the time that's what I use since Anne's in the clinic and she'll flush it. Um, 
I don't bring my equipment to flush. Sometimes I'll use her equipment to flush it. It just depends on the type of wax. There's been occasion that between my equipment and Ann's equipment, I still can't get it out. And I'll have to send you to, it's usually Dr. Shia down the street, ENT, um, for him to get it out. And partially that's because I don't have all my equipment here. So it's either go to Dr. Shia or come to my office. It's sometimes easier just to go to him. Well, I've had it flushed out, but it, when doing that, I get dizzy. If you get dizzy, that means the water's been too hot or too cold. You should not get dizzy. That's actually part of a balance testing, is to put cold water in the ear to see if you do get dizzy. Your balance system's working, but that should not be part of the wax removal. Lukewarm, like you tested for a baby, lukewarm. So, yeah. Other questions? So, we'll just quickly go here. When we talk about tinnitus or tinnitus, um, they're both correct pronunciations. Either one's correct. The theory behind the cause for tinnitus or tinnitus is, for the most part, thought to be um, related to auditory deprivation, related to an area of damage in your ears that's not being stimulated. So even if you don't have hearing loss, there, the thought is there's some sort of damage to your ears that we may not know what or when it happened, but some sort of damage in your ears that your ears are reacting to that's causing this ring or buzz or static or hum. It could be any sort of noise in your ear. So when that damage occurs, the brain, it's really a normal process of the brain to react and create the sound. The brain actually creates lots of sounds in the body. You probably hear your stomach gurgle and your throat make noise and all sorts of things. But this noise, for some reason, really bugs a lot of people. <laughs> and it can happen more often, I think, is the problem. And for some people, it's a problem. Some people, it's a really big problem. And other people, it's really not a big deal. So. This tinnitus, um, the way we react to it is, is the problem. Um, so our reactions, all of our reactions, our emotions are centered in our brain and different parts of our brain than our hearing. It's in our limbic system. Um, I'm doing a very quick <laughs> um, slideshow here. And the limbic system decides if our um, emotion is a pleasant emotion or a um, unpleasant, if it's a fight or flight. And so when we are reacting to something, is it, are we going to have, oh, you know, that's a nice sound, or is it, oh my God, what is that? Um, and so, and it's also reacting to, is that a new sound? Or is that something I've heard before? And when it's a new sound, when it's an unpleasant sound, when it's something we don't like, we're going to get <coughs> tense and stressed and all of those negative reactions. And for the, these people, anyone who has that negative reaction to the tinnitus, it's an unknown negative reaction that the limbic system is sending out and so it sends all those chemicals and all those signals to the body that this is not pleasant i don't like it and the more you hear it the more those chemicals build up and the more your body goes into that fight response and again it can you can have any of these reactions to it There is not a cure for tinnitus, um, but there is a lot that can be done to manage it. And that's what you want to tell anyone who asks about it. 
Um, there is a lot that can be done to manage it. There is, there we are, treatment options are available. Um, so starting at, from the bottom, um, there's lots of alternative treatments, um, um, chiropractic, um, so when you stick the needles, acupuncture. acupuncture. Um, there are things like um, some people just need like jaw. Uh, sometimes it's TMJ. Um, sometimes it's um, stress related and you um, or sleep related. That's a huge one actually. If you're not getting enough sleep or proper sleep, um, sleep apnea can cause it actually. Um, and so there's a lot that really needs to be evaluated um, to make sure certain things are not happening. There are medical conditions, um, medications can cause it, and so it is something that needs to be evaluated and lots of things need to be ruled out. Um, it's usually not the sign of something like catastrophic. Um, we do, when they come to us, we do do a full hearing evaluation and usually more than what I would do here. Um, depending on the type of tinnitus, um, to make sure there's not something more severe going on. Um, hearing aids and sound therapy. Sound therapy is having other sounds on to help, mask it is a, a broad term, but to help keep your brain from being focused on it. So falling asleep with a sound machine on, or a fan going, or music on. We don't recommend the TV because that's more stimulating to the brain. It doesn't help with your sleep. But any of those other just background sounds so that your brain is not hearing that ringing, static, buzzing all the time when you're trying to sleep. Avoiding silence. So if you're having that ringing noises, buzzing, and you're trying to just read a book, it's quiet and your brain's just gonna hear that. So if you turn the radio on, if you put the fan on, if you have a babbling book going, something that your brain can kind of just listen to otherwise, it's very helpful. Especially if you're not that bothered, but just kind of annoyed by the tinnitus, having something else on is very helpful. If you have hearing loss, one, you're hearing more sounds, especially in that region where you do have damage, and you don't have to keep turning on all these other sounds. But also, you're getting stimulation in that region, and some people, we put the hearing aids on, and they go, oh, I don't hear it, or it's not so bad. Just having the hearing aids and getting more amp sound in that same region, that's a huge help for a lot of people, if you have hearing loss. Um, we can play some of those environmental sounds or even white noise through hearing aids so that you're kind of walking around with those sound machines, those type of sounds, very much in the background. And the point is to kind of blend it with the tinnitus so your brain starts to think of it as a more pleasant sound because usually the babbling brook and the um, the ocean sound and static tends to be something your brain can kind of get used to. And so if it's blended with that annoying tinnitus, hopefully your brain just kind of can learn to tolerate it. This type of education and a lot more um, and counseling, um, uh, cognitive behavioral counseling is very effective for tinnitus basically teaching you to be less negative about the tinnitus um, has been shown to be very effective. Lanier. This is a brand new product. This has been out maybe two years, um, approved by the FDA as a treatment for tinnitus. Again, it is not a cure for tinnitus. It is a treatment. Um, it is something that, it's not something that we wanted to be the first route of treatment 
usually we want other things to be tried first. Um, but when I talked about the sound therapy, where we try to blend the sound to try and put the tinnitus in the background, that's been shown to be effective for most people, a majority of people, but not everybody. What linear research has shown is that by combining a, a bimodal approach, so now two other senses, combining that with the tinnitus teaches your brain to be less bothered by the tinnitus, more so than um, the sound by itself. So this is a system that uses the headphones for sound that is programmed to your hearing loss or your hearing levels, plus this right here is a tongue stimulator. So it's a, it just lays on your tongue and it has pulsing vibrations that are kind of like a, um, a, a TENS unit, if you know what that is from physical therapy. It just little vibrations and it just kind of tickles your tongue. It's uh, designed for one hour treatment a day, usually broken down into two 30 minute um, times. The initial treatment is usually 12 weeks. So it's 30, um, two 30 minutes a day for 12 weeks. You do it yourself at home on your own time, but in a very quiet, calming environment. You're not watching TV while you're doing it. You're not, you know, playing with the grandkids at the same time. You're kind of zenning out and relaxing. And um, but on a uh, measurement scale of how bothered you are by your tinnitus, people have gone from a score in the 80s to scores in the 20s. Um, significant results. Um, again, approved by the FDA and um, very successful. So again, it's not for everybody. Um, it is similar cost to a hearing aids. So again, it's not for everybody, but um, for people who are who are have moderate to severe um, tinnitus, um, negative responses to tinnitus, it's something that can be very very helpful. So we are trying to get the word out about that. If anyone has more questions about that, I'm happy to talk about it. And that is my my information for everyone.